so welcome to my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 5, Saints of Imperfection. And I gotta say that this episode definitely was, unfortunately, imperfect. There were a few moments overall in this episode that I really liked, a few beats here and there, but overall I found that this episode didn't quite work together as one of the better episodes of Star Trek Discovery. And that's okay, every season has a few bad episodes, even some of the best seasons of any show. But yeah, for me, this one just didn't quite land always. Uh, it was a bit predictable. Almost everything that I thought that was going to happen actually happened. There's a few logic things that uh, didn't really work for me and I'm kind of confused by. And then a couple things that I am no by no means a Star Trek canon purist where you can't make any changes or that has to fit every little tiny dot and T of canon. But there were a couple things specifically with Section 31 that as a big Deep Space Nine fan in particular just kind of bothered me about how they're portraying Section 31. And again, not a huge canon purist as much as I love Star Trek and Star Trek canon, but it's just it just bugs me and irks me a little bit how they're portraying Section 31. So we're going to get into all of that as I start my recap and review of the episode, so stick with me. I don't know why I said it like that. That was like in a weird announcer. Stick with me! Rawr. You're already watching. You're not going anywhere. I hope. Stay watching. I need the views. <laughs> All right, so we start off the episode with an interesting monologue about Burnham uh, being worried about Tilly, sort of her running in to see that Tilly's gone. I like this bit. It worked for me uh, because we've kind of felt that Burnham and Tilly really do have this big caring relationship, that they do kind of have this sort of sisterly relationship. And I really like that that's kind of built up over the show and how they're still roommates, even though I think Burnham technically should kind of have her own room at this point because she's not in a mutineer anymore. But I do like that situation. You know, we so rarely, I think if ever, see two characters be bunkmates on Star Trek Discovery and I really kind of like that they share that bond and that really sold it to me at the beginning of this episode with Burnham being worried over Tilly. There's a mention of Stamets being a widower which instantly brought to my mind like okay so the monster that's in the Mycelia network is going to be Culber. Like it would just instantly made me be like all right Wilson Cruz is in the credits he's been doing press around this episode of course he's coming back so of course he's going to be the monster. It felt a little bit obvious to me and of course, you know, that does end up being what happens and they kind of set this up here with like reminding you like, oh, Stamets is a widower. Which, do, does that mean that they were married? I wasn't entirely sure if they were married or dating in the last season. I mean, not that, you know, he couldn't still have feelings for him and, and if he, or like be a widower if he wasn't dating or if he wasn't married to him, but I was unclear on that front. And then also Burnham, she wants to have faith. She wants to have faith in a higher power, but she, she doesn't have faith in a higher power. Kind of a bit on the nose with the theme of this season and doesn't terribly tie into the episode. I, I was trying to make like the themes of it work but I just kind of felt forced to be like, look, we're talking about faith this season, so I'll talk about faith in the opening monologue. So they go to uh, intercept Spock's shuttle, um, and Spock knows apparently some really great maneuvers, or does he? Because they finally get the ship, and it turns out it's uh, Mira Georgiou on the shuttle. And then there's this really interesting scene. I like this character beat of when she steps off the shuttle, everyone's like, oh, it's Georgiou. And Burnham keeps her gun up and everyone kind of notices, including Pike. Good character beat kind of shows how everyone kind of trusts Georgio, except for Burnham. And she still has this feeling of, uh, I think only she and Saru are the only ones that technically know of her true identity on the, on the crew at the moment. And again, this is where the logic bugs me a little bit. I can kind of look past it. Like maybe they hid this like classified information because they don't want everyone to believe that Giorgio was the actual Giorgio. And so it's even more classified than what Pike would know. But I feel like Pike already knows about the Mirror Universe because he knows about Lorca. Though I guess we don't know specifically he knows that Lorca was from the Mirror Universe. He just knows that Lorca's an asshole. But he does seem to know a lot about the situation of what happened last season, especially with like Culber and stuff. And that happened in the Mirror Universe. So it's weird to me that Pike wouldn't know that Giorgio is a mirror universe counterpart. Again, it's like one of those, like, I can make it work, but the fact that they didn't make it clear to me is a bit bothersome to me in this episode. And it's a recurring theme throughout a lot of things here. Pike finds out that uh, Michelle Yeoh is on, a, is on a secret mission to capture Spock. We don't necessarily know why. Throughout this whole episode, I love Michelle Yeoh's performance. She just plays this, like, I don't give a fuck about anyone that, like, Plays like to anyone else who doesn't know she's the Mirror Universe Giorgio is like kind of smug assholery, but like deservedly so. She's like apparently a great captain and kind of deserves to have a smug attitude. But like you just read into the, this this like nest of vipers thing that she. I love that little thing she is Burnham. Ugh. Just Michelle Yeoh is just chewing the scenery in pure Mirror Universe fashion. A good Mirror Universe character always loves to chew the scenery, and she's just playing it to a T. And I 
every scene that Michelle Yeoh is in, she is always a highlight in it. So at least, you know, she's a bright spot throughout this whole episode. But again, here's the thing that bugs me. We learn that, you know, we get a call from Captain Leland, who is a friend of Pike's. And we sort of set up this um, argument between the two of them where Pike is sort of like, I don't believe in Section 31's values. And Leland's like, I do the bad thing to keep you doing what you're doing, which is like the classic Section 31 argument. Like we saw that all the way back in Deep Space Nine. Great argument. I, I like that sort of setup and how they set that up at the end of the episode going forward. That'll be an interesting sort of uh, push and pull, I hope. Sort of looking at like this darker side of things and Pike being this bright captain. And actually, it'll be a great sort of look at the argument that people had about Star Trek Discovery Season 1, about like just talking about like, oh, Discovery Season 1 was this darker thing, and then Season 2 is trying to be a bit brighter. So I kind of see that as like a cool little opposing thoughts there, and sort of bringing that in back in here works perfectly to just kind of mirror, no pun intended, the fan discussion right now about Discovery in general. I think that's just a great idea. That all being said, Section 31, how they set them up in this episode doesn't make sense to me with what's set up before. And again, like I said, not a big canon purist, but Section 31 was never supposed to be a part of Starfleet. They were a separate organization that worked outside of Starfleet because they didn't have to, they weren't held to any standard. Like the whole point of Section 31 wasn't it's bad to have Black Ops group. What it actually is about is it's bad to have a Black Ops group who doesn't have anyone overseeing them. But now making them part of Section 30, or making them part of Starfleet, kind of has them have oversight, as we saw with Adam, Admiral Cornwall at the end of the episode. So, like, of course every military group is going to have black ops. That makes sense to me. Like, I, as much as I like to believe in the great morals, like, yes, I get you need to do covert shit. That's just part and parcel with the game, unfortunately. But when you're bringing in Section 31, you want to discuss something better, but you need to have those black ops held to some sort of standard. And... That's how that sort of storyline works. And here they're just saying it's part of like Starfleet. And then also the fact that Section 31 is well known, which, you know, in Deep Space Nine and in Enterprise, when they appeared and showed up in Enterprise as well, no one knew who they were. No one knows about Section 31. No one's ever heard of them. They're just that fucking good. And then in here, we're just sort of like, yeah, everyone kind of is aware. And they have black badges that signify that. That everyone's aware of it even doesn't even quite work with season one because they said oh black badges i thought they were just a myth but then everyone kind of knows it again maybe it's just something that burnham and pike know but then we have ash tyler's liaison so everyone kind of on the ship knows about section 31 the whole section 31 setup just is is bugging me and i'm just gonna have to like let that go and that's fine i'll only complain about it really for this episode unless it becomes a glaring problem later on so i'm just like i'll let it go and again, not a big canon person, but it just the, the setup here bothers me. But that being said, it's fine within the world of the show. It just may not work in the world of canon and with how I originally envisioned Section 31. But again, I'm willing to accept it here for what the show is trying to do. And I don't even think it really works in this episode, honestly. <clears throat> I like how they're sort of being set up, but the situation wasn't one really morally gray versus not morally gray. It's... We're rescuing a we're rescuing Tilly. That's not a morally great mission to me. I would have introduced Section Thirty One when there was something morally ambiguous going on, and that could have created that push and pull between Pike and Leland and their sort of viewpoints on how to do things. But here was just like this is a normal situation, and Pike just doesn't want to accept help because it's the organization. But there's like I'm like why not just accept the help? It, it, it just none of it works for me. It just this episode just didn't have any thematic cohesion for me. Anyways, enough venting about that. We get this idea of the organic transporter that teleported Tilly into the Mycelia Network. Organic transporter, cool idea. Love it. I, I like that idea of an organic transporter. It's just kind of very um, Geiger-esque, I think, is the guy who created the Xenomorph. It just had that sort of like cool feel to it, that like organic feel, like alien sort of thing. And so the crew goes into the uh, Mycelia Network to go rescue Tilly. So we get Burnham and Stamets going to the Mycelia Network to rescue Tilly. A couple, one other thing before I get to that, I did like the moment where Ash Tyler, between Ash Tyler and Burnham, great little scene between the two of them about her kind of questioning his motives, and also a great scene between Burnham and Pike as well about building that trust between Burnham and Pike. I really like that. Like, Pike kind of knows Burnham well enough now that he can kind of read her and knows when something's off, and he's building that trust. He's working as a captain to be like, look, I'm not going to push you for this, but I just, I need to be let in. It's subtle this season, but I just really like the building relationship between Burnham and Pike. An officer learning to trust her captain again. It's just... 
and and trusting him because he's a good person. Just I, I really love those small scenes between the two of them every episode. It's another highlight. And also I like the fact that when uh, Ash Tyler comes on the bridge and Stemmets kind of takes a moment to notice him because obviously Ash Tyler was the one who killed Culber. In the Mycelia Network, Tilly is asked by May to help her and I love how Tilly's a little bit frustrated for saying but then instantly is like, what do you need me to do? Great Starfleet character there and character building there. It's just like, damn it. All right, I'm in. I'm not gonna even really think about it. I'm gonna take a second to be like mm, frustrated and then I'm, I'm instantly gonna help you. Great. Great stuff. Discovery goes halfway into the Mycelia Network. Also a great visual, like this like pond in space where they're like underwater. You know, it was just it, the visual of that, the creative team there, great job of having Disco just being like kind of sunk underwater, but in space. I, the concept of that is just brilliant. I don't know how they wrote that in the script. And I don't know who, how they managed to think about that in the, the uh, VFX department, but kudos, kudos. Get, give them an Emmy. So we go into there, they kind of find Tilly pretty quickly. It was a bit of a disappointment. It was like we didn't really get to explore much. It was just sort of like, yeah, she's right there. And we start looking for the monster and we learn that the mon monster is actually Culber. Again, surprise, surprise. I also like the moment between uh, Tilly and May where she pinky swears. This really fits Tilly's character, but also kind of reinforced that idea of what Pike was saying earlier is like Starfleet is a promise and Starfleet always does the right thing. Just a good reinforcing of that. I, I, everyone gives shit to Discovery Season 1 about not reinforcing Starfleet ideals, which I, I don't agree with. I think that it was doing a dark place to get to a good place, but I like how this season is just constantly just showing us what good Starfleet does. They make promises, they go, they never let people get left behind from, you know, the big crew willing to sacrifice for the for one person and one person willing to sacrifice and make a promise to another. It's just really great Starfleet ideals all around there. Oh, there was also a little callback that got the old, the old slash new communicators because they're sort of be better direct communication with the bridge. Cool little nice little explaining why they have the, the old style flip phone communicators. And so we get this nice little moment between Stemmets and Culber, you know, telling about their first date and that's sort of what gets Culber to sort of like calm down and come out and step out. And then we also get May kind of reacting and be like, no, you need to kill him. And we got this cool moment of basically Tilly being like, no, to you, to you, he's the monster and to him, you're the monster. And sort of this good idea there, but it's never really fully explored. It's again, this episode's kind of thematically all over the place. There's a lot of good threads that you could pull on. And I guess you could maybe say like, oh, the monster from a different point of view thing is like Pike versus section 31. But I, that doesn't quite work because we're not, I, I would hope that we're not supposed to like section 31 and their methods. So it, it just, it's a little bit of a mishmash thematically. I can't really like pull out any threads here and it just doesn't really work for me. And that's, that's kind of the problem. A lot of great ideas that you could pull into a theme, but then you never, make it all match up for me, which is kind of sad. It's just, a, it's just a fun little adventure horror movie thing. And even the adventure kind of is like, I knew exactly what was going to happen. But the moment between Culver and Stamets is nice. And then there's another moment later on that I, I, I did adore. And this was sort of the stand up moment of the episode for me was when Stamets can't be pulled through to get back to um, our universe, to our side of the mycelial network, to get back to normal space, whatever dimension, whatever the term is. It's a really great scene where Culber says, you know, I'm willing to die so you can let me go. And Hugh doesn't want to accept that, but, uh, or sorry, uh, Stamets doesn't want to accept that, but Hugh says this really great line, you know, you love life and that's why I love you. There are a million reasons to love you, but that's mine. Beautiful line beautiful line and just really well done there by both performers Stemmets and uh, Hugh Wilson Cruz and Anthony Rapp really selling that scene I wish they had had a little bit longer to delve on it like we gave so much time to the Burnham and Saru scene last time which I loved that scene it was so powerful and it's kind of sad to kind of short shrift the actual love relationship of Stemmets and Culber here that they kind of have these like quick moments. They're not really allowing them to like hit home and everyone kind of is around them. They don't have like a private moment. And I hope we get to see that later on, maybe in the next episode now that Culber's back. But uh, I just wish we had some scenes of the two of them just really getting a chance to sit and feel for a moment. And we got like little bits of it that they just keep getting interrupted and it just never super landed. But that line, that one hit home. And that one was well performed and well done by both actors. There's this bit about like, oh, Tilly and uh, May know each other so well. Didn't really get that. Tilly was kind of like against May. And there's not really a sense that like Tilly knows May that well. Other than like what she couldn't have intuited anyways. 
So I don't really buy that May knows Tilly. That whole thing didn't really work. And I guess it's setting up that May's going to come back later and be friends with Tilly. And Tilly's kind of sad about the fact that she has to give up May. May was such a abusive force in her brain. I don't understand why you would want that. It just, it, I, I, the way it was set up didn't really buy it for me. I mean, I guess you could because like May helped her in that one episode way back when she first appeared uh, in episode two, I believe. So maybe, but I just wish we had moments of that too and i guess the pinky swear is kind of that too i maybe i'm maybe, maybe it works it's just not as strong as it could have been for me it could have sold it a little bit more but otherwise it just it didn't work that they would know each other pike no like tyler is like the only note that i wrote for that for the one scene on the bridge pike does not like tyler in any way shape or form i'm sure that's going to sort of build throughout the season they pull everyone out hugh comes back to our universe looking super sexy because he goes through the uh, organic teleporter really cool idea Love that. There's two random scenes at the end. Admiral Cornwall showing up. Again, sort of explaining that like Section 31 is part of Starfleet and an, an accepted and known part of it. And this sort of like Pike forgiving this Captain Leland saying, you know, I forgive you. It's fine. We'll make it work. And we have differing views, but... And I just, I hope that it comes into more, like they, they actually have opposing views and Pike actually opposes it instead of just like being like, I forgive you and we'll make it work. It just, uh, it just doesn't read to me it just didn't read and i hate to be down on this episode but just like it just doesn't work it just doesn't for me um like i said as much as i love discovery a lot of the stuff this episode just didn't didn't really hit it for me and also like admiral cornwall i guess it could have been a little while but was just admiral cornwall just hanging out on the ship the whole time well, or was some time has passed possibly little unclear but we do learn some cool stuff that tachyons were involved in the uh in the red burst so it could be time travel could be cloaks which reads to me as like romulans if it's going to be a cloak or klingons i guess too but it would be either romulans or time travel and i'm assuming i probably would lean on time travel that maybe the red angels are actually spock actually i'm coming up with that right now that maybe spock is the one that's been time traveling around and appearing to different people and saving people maybe which, random idea probably is not true but it's a thought and then we get a scene between uh burnham and giorgio basically burnham saying i don't trust you giorgio a great little line of let's said the scorpion to the frog calling the sort of old storyline of like the scorpion who uh kills the frog and sort of kills them both as they go across the river that's sort of the last little scene and didn't really tell us anything new other than yeah they don't really trust each other i do like the implication though that emperor jojo still cares for burnham and I kind of like this idea of maybe Giorgio's being up front with us and actually does want to rescue Spock. I'm sure there's more to it, but I always like that idea of like, we're not supposed to trust these dark characters and then they actually do the right thing. And they actually are deserving of trust in these specific moments. Maybe not deserving of trust, but they are saying what they are saying. I kind of always like that subversion. It's a cool little... Cool little subversion when that actually plays out like that. We'll see how it, how it grows. So all in all in this episode, kind of reflects a point of light for me in terms of like uh, being an episode where it's sort of setting stuff up but not really being a great episode in and of itself. Though I think point of light has a lot more thematic cohesion in that episode. This one just felt like it was telling a singular story unlike point of light, but it just, the story was just doing things that we knew had to happen. We knew Section 31 had to get involved. We knew Ash Tyler had to get involved. We knew Culber had to come back at some point. We had to deal with the spore on Tilly. So it was like all this stuff we kind of knew was going to happen. And it all just kind of happened in this episode. And I was just sort of sitting there being like, yep, that's exactly what I thought. Whereas like last episode, there were surprises. Like the the twist with the, the, the sphere being, you know, making last contact. And it was dying. It wasn't malicious. And Saru not dying. And things like that. And Saru's um, whole faith being a lie. And things like that. That all surprised me. Whereas this one's just sort of like, yep, I'm checking the boxes. And I know exactly where this is going. And it just just felt predictable. Had some wonky logic, both in terms of the episode itself and in the Star Trek universe. So, And while there were some small ideas and moments that I liked overall, like the organic transporter or the pinky swear moment or the moments between Stemmets and Culber that were really strong, these little sort of pieces that I really enjoyed doesn't really come together for me as a whole strong episode. So it's unfortunate. And like I said, I love Star Trek Discovery. The past four episodes of this season have all been really strong. Even Point of Light, which everyone kind of hates, I thought that that one was a decently strong episode, if not one of the best. This one, I think, for me, might be the first dud of the season. And that's, and again, 
that just happens. Every season of every show has some clunkers, especially in episodic television. Take it what it is. I'm sure it'll be back to fine form next season or next episode. Uh, looks really cool. Looks like we're delving into uh, Saru's culture again, which I'm super pumped for. The trailer for next season or next episode has me very excited to explore that storyline. That trailer was really, really cool. But this episode just just didn't do it for me. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, if you like this review and you want to see more reviews, I do weekly discovery reviews, please check out my channel. And also tomorrow I'm going to be releasing a new video as I do every Friday. Uh, that's a analysis of Laurel. So I'm going to be doing these cool little character thematic analyses of Star Trek Discovery and sort of delving into the different storylines of different characters and what they mean and what they sort of talk about and sort of the themes coming out of them. So if you want to find that video, please come back to my channel tomorrow and that'll be up. And then I'll be doing a few more of them. I think the next one that I have planned is a Lorca one. So we'll have some fun there. And until next time, live long and prosper.